I've always worked with small business owners. Is that weird to say? Beyonce has a small business. Destiny's Child is like <laughs> one family owns it. I think it's and- called a family business. I don't know if I'd call that small. Top leaders, meaningful conversation, actionable advice, bulldoze complacency, ignite inspiration, create impact. Produced by the Southwestern family of companies. This is the Action Catalyst. Today's guest is Emmy Award-winning media brand advisor, strategist, and content coach, Vinny Podestivo. Vinny spent time as a network executive at MTV Networks for nine years, as well as with Bravo and a number of other networks, where he was an early pioneer of reality television. Currently, he is the founder of VPE Talent and also hosts his own hybrid podcast and television program titled, aptly enough, I Have a Podcast. We hope you enjoy. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Am I early? Am I too early? Sorry. So, what about you in Brooklyn? I know you're from there. So are you usually based out of there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm from. I'm originally from Staten Island, so I didn't move too far. But yeah, I stayed in Brooklyn. I've been working from home for about like five, five years now. Everyone's like, you're so lucky. I'm like, no, I had to learn how to work with somebody else <laughs> in my space. It wasn't like <laughs> everything just continued as the, as norm. But, but virtual producing... Uh, a lot of like consulting with beauty brands and celebrities that have sort of other types of apparel brands or beauty brands, skincare brands. That was like my pandemic gig. Turning like Instagram studios into podcast studios. It's been fun, by the way, helping brand owners that don't identify as being creators. You know, they're they're chemists, estheticians by trade, uh, and now they get to be creators. And then I just give them like powerful tools <laughs> like Instagram. <laughs> you know, there's this new thing out. It's called Instagram. The kids call it the Graham. I geek out. I <laughs> get excited about this. It, it's like the, the the creative toys are so much better now than when I was a kid. You know, I had to be an intern and get approved by like a network executive. And you know, now now people with an iPhone are like full on executive producers. Here I am, like the Pied Piper or the the British Eater with the so and so are coming, whatever that. <laughs> Paul Revere. Yeah, Paul Revere. <laughs> the you know. British are coming. I know. I know. I did. Yeah, exactly. Instagram guides are changing. Instagram guides are changing. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be like pulling teeth, I can tell. Uh, okay. <laughs> you obviously have a ton of recognition. I think I read you have an Emmy or two or three. So that makes you seem super cool and like you have this super cool job from your perspective what is cool about your job i know what the world thinks yeah yeah. do you know how i described my job just earlier to a family member and it made me laugh i said i've been in unpreferred media my entire (laughs) life (laughs) Ooh, you worked for mtv Ooh, bravo really you did that housewife thing that i'm like i got to work with awesome storytellers that had to go through a television network to get their stories heard by hundreds of millions of people globally, worldwide. And MTV was a brand that had that reach. So because of where I was at the timing of when stories became an economy in and of themselves, they became a commodity. I think inherently, I think there's something cool in helping the underdog. I think that's cool. Everything I've done has always been helping someone who felt under something, get over something. And usually it was a creative way to do it. And I think what might be interpreted cool about that are maybe the people that I got to help, for sure, because they changed culture. So, for example, the challenge on MTV. You know, when it came time to host the challenge, uh, I knew it had to be an athlete. And we had uh, Johnny Mosley and, and, and Dave Mira, God rest his soul, host. And, and we met TJ Lavin. TJ was an athlete, a BMXer at a time where BMX as the sport itself was getting landed on the map. So he was one of the front faces for that. And we had this really probably be very politically incorrect and super inappropriate, not safe for work conversation um, once that changed our career, that changed changed our career, literally changed our careers. I was going to say lives, but it changed our careers first. I felt heard and seen as a gay guy by an athlete. And I felt that in a room where I wasn't going to be, that I had an ally and someone who wasn't even asking to be, he just showed up that way. And there was a conversation we had that just made me, I remember the, the feeling of, of being so respected and so safe at a time where in the media, well, I don't even have to get into sexism in the media. We look, look at you know, what it did to Britney and, and some of the females, what, what drove Jessica Simpson to having 
a show called Newlyweds was literally her way of slowing the story down. MTV used to give artists three minutes to tell their story in music videos. She asked for 30. No one was asking for that. So when you ask for things, you get them. And then also I learned from the audience's perspective, the thing, you know, that they support things they love and they support things they love to hate too. Do you still keep in touch with Jessica? I do. Yeah. And she's doing Simpson. well. Yeah. They're, I mean, so, so empowered by her story and yeah. she's, she's done it again. Right. And, and it, it amazes me, by the way, this is the best part is if you would have asked the Mandy, Mandy Moore, Jessica Simpson, Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears, if you would have asked the four of them, who's going to be the billionaire? I promise you, Jessica, most, I don't want to say pro, I'll say it, it, she would not have been top three back then, but she, she had the gift of reality TV at a point in time where we were, what we didn't have until 2007 with social media, where we couldn't understand feedback about things we were saying. And she was lucky to get that in 2000, where she had some control, not all, but some control over what ultimately hit air. So let me ask you this. One of the things that is said about you is that you're the man behind reality TV. That's not fair. I got to give a big shout out to Jonathan Murray, Mary and Mary Ellis Bunham, uh, who was his partner in crime. <laughs> so I'm assuming then the inspiration for you behind reality TV came from the Blair Witch Project. Uh, by the way, that's hysterical. <laughs> you see that. Uh, to be honest, uh, my job at first was to hire hosts. So the first big moment for me beyond discovering talent was talent were not touchable or approachable at MTV until my department got there. So first off, when MTV was created, the power was in creating a platform that required a new form of media. That's that's cool that MTV empowered artists to be able to create these three-minute music videos. MTV supported it, paid thousands of dollars to the labels to help offset the cost of that. And then I think 20 years later, that's when the, our audience leapt to YouTube. That is when they found YouTube. By the way, I have to point out, shout out to the first VJ, Adam Curry at MTV, who also created iPodder, which is the first podcast. He like invented really simple syndication, RSS, and the, uh, this idea of, of podcasting. Rockin'. What have you seen from a talent perspective, talent 10 years ago that you went looking for versus talent today? Well, the economy is funny then. You know, t 10 years ago, we're talking about the real people economy. Maybe we certainly wouldn't have called it the creator economy then. The real people economy predated the expert economy, predated the entrepreneur economy, which is now turned into the influencer economy. I think we're currently in the creator economy right now. By the way, predicting the future I think editors haven't had their shine yet. And I don't know if you've read the Bible or not, but King James is a pretty famous name. He's not even in it. Just a really famous <laughs> editor. So like the power of editing, I'm telling you, it's out there. The power of editing. What, what changes 10 years ago, the responsibility of networks. How about that for starters? 10 years ago, there was lashback to what certain networks were allowing to happen on their air. And there, there's now a, a sense of, of needing more control. Um, retention becomes the biggest, you know, issue in television. So that changes talent immediately, by the way. TV networks aren't trying to get you to tune into their network for the first time. They're trying to keep you on their network as long as possible. So you're going to see a lot more of like cross-channel talent, familiar faces throughout the entire network. What Disney did with Marvel and how they built these separate audiences, right? Because you want to feel identified and recognized in the right audience. And when multiple audience come together, that's community. Multi-demographic retention, talent becomes a game that even on the agency level, agents are no longer looking for new talent to bring in new streams of ROI. They've got existing talent and they're look, leaning on that talent to create additional streams of ROI. Hey, so let's take this a little bit broader here because one of the things I think I've heard you mention a couple of times, I think is really interesting. I'm running a company. Uh, or, you know, I run a team. 20 years ago, TV was it. I mean, we had a few other platforms, but now we've got all these different things. So speak to me about, I have a brand. Now there's so many things. Talk me through that. Yeah, the answer is time. First and foremost, that's where I'm, I go to a blank piece of paper and I'm just literally gonna draw a timeline. I'm gonna put today's date. I'm gonna put the end of the year. I'm gonna figure out what I'm capable of creating and doing and impacting the next two to three months. I'm going to look at that schedule and multiply it by four so I can figure out what an annualized plan is. 
Um, by the way, this is a weird way to answer the question. And when I was trying to lose weight, I didn't want to lose weight. I didn't want to be a pound less than where I was yesterday. I wanted to be a pound less from where I was last year. It was way more fun for me to compare myself to last year. And what it does is it gives me the time to refine and slowly, confidently, and more, more importantly, sustainably get the results that I ultimately want to get to. So so you mentioned at the top of this, my uh, I have one Emmy. It is my first Emmy. I won my first Emmy last year from this guest bedroom I'm working in now, by, by the way, Maron. I spent 25 years of my life crawling on people's kitchen counters, hiding from the, you know, hiding from the camera so you don't see me in the shots. And I realized that the content I was working on, the position that I was playing in those, in those, in those productions didn't qualify me. I won an Emmy because I went out and looked for an opportunity. I, I actually found an opportunity. And then I thought to myself, well, I want to be mindful who I win, who I win it with, because I'm going to be grouped with these people forever. And I also want to make sure it's the right project because people are going to say, what did you win it for? I won it for, it's called Red Flags. Uh, it's, a, it's a documentary series about a woman who comes out of rehab. And it's the red flags that we might spot, you know, with the 60 days that she's coming out of it. The importance of credits. You know, I, I mentioned earlier uh, how awesome, how powerful it is that as a podcast owner, not only can I can I get credit for being an executive producer and get creative credit, but more importantly, I can give it to the people who've touched my project. And that's that's a data point that Google will not know unless you tell it. You, your podcast being on someone's resume, maybe on LinkedIn, for example, let's say best case scenario, is not the same as IMDb owned by Amazon telling Google that this person worked on this episode, which also had this guest connected to this award. And it's a gigantic form of discoverability. So credits, those help you get discovered. Those help sustain the message, making impact and reaching the people that you want. Yeah. I, again, I geek out about it, but that, that's what podcasting, that's what independent side of media does for us. And that's why I'm fully leaned in. I've always worked with small business owners, is that weird to say. Beyonce has a small business, Destiny's Child. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> One family owns it. I think it's and- called a family business. I don't know if I'd call that small. Well, I mean, when you look at the executives that are on her board, I would say it's less than 25. You know, as as big as the brand is at that level, in the it's a it's a really tight inner circle. I think that's where we can all relate to it. It's it's weird to say it that way, but I think one of the things you just said that was really interesting and I think very counterintuitive. Most people feel, okay, I have a plan. And it needs to be long and drawn out and systematic. And actually what I heard from you is the exact, exact opposite. Talking about the word, hey, the second you're a podcaster, you qualify. Mm-hmm. You're in. So go, go, do do it all as fast as possible. That's how you get out there. Yeah, you don't have to wait 25 years to qualify for an Emmy Award. Like I'm telling you, all I did is apply. I I saw what qualified to win. What I had a, I had a goal. I told a couple of friends. Um, but I make these decisions now based on the future. My secret to success has been not making decisions based on now, making decisions based on the outcome of now. I, I don't care about this current you know, choice if it doesn't get me the outcome, the larger outcome that you, you've called me in to make happen, making me realize that every room that I'm in is important and I hold on to my name. It's one hell of a long name. It's not easy to say. It's like, Vinny Potestivo. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So one of the things you said very, very early on was most of the folks that are launching, they're not creators by nature. They have a passion for something and they figure out how to package it into something that can be bought by somebody else. That makes them then a business owner. What mistakes do you see those folks making? Because they're, again, let's assume they're not naturally marketers or they don't Mm -hmm. know social media or what, what mistakes do you see them make? Yeah, here, here's here are two quick answers. One is they do it by themselves, and we try to learn a lot by ourselves. And I actually recommend not learning and pecking away and slow learning and going and learning. I, I really recommend stop, learn completely in its entirety, and then implement. I think that if it takes two weeks to get a website out of the gate because we're learning and updating, learning and updating small little pieces, that it had to be just shut down for four or five solid days and gotten clear on what our story and how we want our story to be received, not just share, not just sold or told, but received and shared. Clarity is one of those things that I think is often overlooked um, in creativity. 
Um, there's a focus on how do I get something accomplished as opposed to who could I be working with. There's a great book called Who Not How, and it's it's all about people and networking and making sure they're set up for success. Um, and in terms of picking those people, uh, I think there are four or three types of creatives. There's an analytical creator, a strategic creator, and a technical creator. So you, you might find a better partnership if, if you identify as an analytical creator, if, if performance marketing and Google ads and Facebook ads and all that's important to you, you might do really well with you partnering with a technical, someone who's, who's more focused on SEO and automation and integrations, or even a strategic creator who's going to bring in relationships and focus on the person to person component to it more so. So, so just making sure that you're complementing your creative skills. But whether you identify as an analytical, technical, or strategic creator is sort of up to you. So you do this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you're usually sitting in my seat, probably a little bit more than sitting in your seat. Yeah, yeah. What is the one thing you don't get asked that you wish you did? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would want to say there's a lot of focus on what we're talking about now. You know, it's all about getting in touch and handing off. I wish people talked about sustainability a bit more. I wish they said after they're done with this, what is the next thing they should do? Not how do they get in touch with you? Like we just started a conversation. We're responsible for what happens next. So how do we get to help the people who are hearing this podcast do it? I, I feel like it's a, a people to people responsibility. But for us, you know, for the people listening to this, I appreciate people being sent my way. But the real, the real, I hope the real honest answer is like, hopefully we would get to be part of the answer. I don't, I don't they're, they follow you for a reason. They, they're, they're learning about me through you for a reason. And I think that together we can come up with better solutions than I could ever do it, you know, on my own. So I wish there was more conversation about that, about the sustainability about, of, of impact more so than let me help you grow your business and how do they buy your next product and that sort of transactional element of it. Because it's not about strategy. It's about tactics. Really, right? Like, with a, like, like, I don't call myself a strategist because the last thing you need is more strategy from the more opinions and strategy. I don't care who I helped out. I don't care what I went through in life. Sometimes strategies feel deeply like opinions to me, and I'm, and sometimes I want to remove my opinion from the conversation, and sometimes I lean into my opinion. But tactics—that's something that I feel confident in sharing twenty four seven with with anyone, as long as they're using them for the betterment of of the good, you know, and I, and I put, I put that energy out there as well. I, I intentionally make sure people know that this, these tools need to be used for positive impact and that I, I won't stand to have them used otherwise. That's why I've been sensitive about working outside of the small gated talent community that I got so lucky to get to work with because I, I truly got to work with them and understand their intentions and scaling what I do with people who I don't truly understand their intentions is scary to me. Because I've seen the impact of what media can do to change a conversation, to change a law, to give us rights, you know, hopefully back, to get more out of us, you know. And I, I got to say, I bring up Mandy Moore and Beyonce and they fight for our rights. Like they show up in places that are important for us. Matthew McConaughey, it's weird to say, I never got to work with Matthew. But like they, these, these talent have a, a role, you know, and, and, and an impact. So um, how we empower them and who we select to celebrate and turn into celebrities, that's us as an audience. That You can't blame MTV for a certain type of show or Bravo for a certain type of show because I, I was at the network. I'll tell you what the network says, but the audience watched it. I think this is not a, something I've heard a lot out there and it echoes your idea of sustainability, of impact, which I, mm, I think there's a lot of power in that, but it's support versus promote. Yeah. And think about how organic that is, because if you really support something, it naturally gets promoted. But people today, we're so used to so much coming at us. When you, I mean, don't you think? Yeah, we're so absolutely. used to it. It's almost at times we put up that guard like, oh, don't come at me. Don't come at me. But when it's, hey, this is just a cool thing. Come be a part of it or come listen to it or whatever. The byproduct is the promotion, but the intention is the support. And I think it makes for a much more organic response, which in turn, to your point, it's with the right intention. Yeah, because there's cause. There's, there's, there's inspired action that's bringing them to you. There's momentum bringing them to you. What's going to happen after they find you is two things. One, they're going to share maybe verbally with their team. This is a real legit way to grow your brand. 
without having to focus on the name, the artwork, all of the creative ways that we understand branding impacts the, 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 the way that our message gets out there. But by focusing on the actual message itself and stripping away all of that creative packaging, unwrapping the gift, it makes it easier to share. It makes it easier to discover. That's just one way that, that we can help ourselves be more discoverable. You don't need to be more visible to be discovered. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, more was more was more was more. Even that term, no press is bad press. I can't disagree with it. Don't tell me there's no such thing as bad press. That's long, long as the day when that was the truth. Now we have a choice and a decision of how we get represented. We don't, we don't, we're not at the whim of five public companies that have access to the airwaves. We, the power of people, can change that. And, and it stems from what we create and what we consume. So y'all watching those weird shows and then complaining about it, guilty pleasure. <laughs> now I'm in defensive media. <laughs> <sighs> That's awesome. Vinny, you have been super generous with your time, your willingness to share. Very appreciative. Anything else? Thanks. No, there's nothing I haven't shared that I also haven't documented. So if I can bring that up, uh, I have I have a free creator hub. There's PDF versions and HTML versions. I ask for you to come and sign up for a free account at that vpe.tv. Over 100 awards worthy of winning. 60 podcast platforms I think every podcaster should be on in 2023. Uh, 50 creator platforms that pay. I have hundreds of tactics and links to share the power of the creator economy, how, how to how to convert using influencer marketing. I have a free masterclass up there. So please feel free to use these resources to be successful early and consistently throughout your career. And say hi to me on LinkedIn. Vinny, thank you. Really fun. So nice to meet you. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And as always, thanks for listening.